Hello, how's it going? Welcome back. Today I have with me a coffee, a knife, and a box which contains a Schumacher MI1, which I got used off of eBay. I've never opened it. We're going to do the unboxing together. Now I'll tell you a little bit about this model and we'll see what sort of condition this thing is in because I really have no idea. Right then. Packaging. I see packaging. Lots of packaging. I've never actually looked at one of these things close up. I've seen them before. But here we go. Oh, it's used all right. And there we are. It's a bit filthy. Now, I don't know if I overpaid for this or not. I paid £50 plus a few quid delivery. Um, right, before we have a proper close inspection, that really is filthy. Let me give you a little bit of history about this, the Schumacher MI1. And history starts with a different car, which is the same car. Back in 2001, Schumacher released the Mission, which was their top spec, flagship, high-end racing touring car. Competed in club, national and world championship levels. Um, it, over the few years it was out, it competed against the likes of the Team Associated TC3, Team Lossy, Triple XS, HPI Pro 3, uh, Yokomo MR4 TC Special, cars like that. And it had some success. I didn't race against many of them. The club I was at in sort of 2003, 2004 and a bit of 2005, I believe there was only one guy who regularly raced a, a mission. In 2004, the mission was replaced by the MI2, which literally stood for the Mission Impossible 2. <laughs> but obviously they couldn't call it that, so it was the MI2. And then MI3, MI4, etc. Towards the end of the 2000s, Schumacher realized that there was a bit of a hole in the market. The market was crying out for some good entry-level club racing cars. The sort of thing that someone new to the racing scene could justifiably afford to get them started. It was competitive, it was well-balanced, it was well-sorted, but it wasn't ridiculously complicated, ridiculously fragile, or had the ridiculous price that the touring cars had at that point. I mean, when I was racing in the early 2000s, the prices were high for a top-end touring car. By the 2010s, they were kind of silly. So the market needed some decent entry-level stuff. So what Schumacher decided to do was re-release the original mission and name it the MI-1. This is it here. So this is essentially a re-release of the original mission with a couple of small changes. The bottom deck on the original mission was different. It was wider, it had slots cut in for the the way that cells, nickel metal hydride cell batteries used to have the six cells like that, one after the other. And they had indentations cut out for them. They were sort of no longer around. It was lipos by this point. So this has got a lipo battery bar rather than nickel metal hydrides. I also heard it's got a slightly different uh, rear shock tower, but I can't for the life of me see any difference in any of the photos, so that might not be true. But essentially, it was the same car, and you could literally just replace the bottom deck, and you could change your mission into an MI1. The MI1 is made of the S1 composite material that Schumacher uses to this day. A few years afterwards, in about 2014, I believe, maybe 13, I think it's 14, um, Schumacher updated and replaced the MI1 with the MI1 V2, or to give the full title, the Schumacher Mission Impossible 1 version 2, uh, which again was the same car, different bottom deck, optimized for LiPo, even more so than this, because LiPo technology was moving forward. Different top deck was the most, these were the obvious changes. The top deck was narrowed in at the middle and came back out again, probably to adjust the chassis rigidity. So the MI1 V2 is the last version of the MI1, which in itself was a mission. So it was the last version of the mission. So, uh, history lesson aside, what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at a very, very filthy old touring car, frankly. Um, I couldn't tell by the photographs, they weren't amazing. 
but there are a few problems with this I can see already and some parts missing. We have an extremely perished belt. Front belt is knackered looking. Um, I mean, it looks like it'd hold on pretty much, but uh, I'll try and source a belt. The rear belt is not great either. It is better, but it's not great. There's anti roll bars included on this one, front and rear. But the anti roll bar mount point here on this side, the back right is missing. So the anti roll bar in the back isn't working. Um, I might be providing a little bit of anti roll at one side, but not the other. So that's not ideal. That needs to be either sourced another one or removed um, because I might not need to have anti roll bars on this car. The spur gear is knackered. It's the teeth are really worn away and kind of soft looking. I mean, it's worse on one side than the other. Well, yeah, it's not great. I think I'll source a spur as well. It certainly looks like this has been raced indoors. There's a indoor Schumacher mini pins, which were the, the right tires to run on wooden surface, especially with a narrow like this. They need replaced as well, although they'll do a few races. It's amazing actually how uh, how well some really worn mini pins actually perform. Interesting design of chassis actually. I've never really seen one up close before. It's odd. The belt design is odd. Um, on a normal twin belt car, I mean it looks relatively normally set up. I mean the motors uh, in front of the spur rather than behind the spur, which is slightly unusual. Um, which means the, the spur is slightly further back than normally. But it is certainly normal to have a longer front belt and a shorter back belt. A lot of touring cars throughout, you know, 20 years or more have used that sort of design. However, unlike a standard double belt design, such as seen on this Yokomo MR4 TC Custom, the pulley design and the way the belts are integrated is completely different. On most tuning cars, including that one, um, you get the central pulley running off the spur. So the central pulley is where the front belt wraps around, so that turns the front belt, which turns the front axle, and the same pulley turns the back belt, which turns the back axle. So everything comes through the spur in this pulley, and you have the belts coming off it. So pulley, front belt, back belt. On this, it's different. On this, the front belt goes all the way back and wraps around the rear differential. Okay. So the rear differential is like a twin channel. And then it's the rear belt that running off the pulley. So in other words, pulley, rear belt. So the pulley turns the rear belt and the rear axle turns the front axle all the way to the front. Odd. Now I don't know why They've done that. The, there's plenty of space to run the, the front belt was right past the spur. So if they wanted to, they could have ran it like a more traditional setup. I have read a blurb that talks about, oh, massive, you know, acceleration out the corners and really smooth drive and everything. But the blurbs for all touring cars say that. So I don't know if there's any real truth to it. I also don't know how long they stuck to that design, but it is unusual. Another slightly odd design is the fact that the turnbuckles for the likes of the servo horn here and the front toe are normal sort of adjustable with a spanner turnbuckles. Whereas the camber ones aren't, they're much beefier and they require you to put an allen key or something through them and twist them. Which is actually better for the likes of wearing out and possibly they're thicker and stronger. But it's weird that they've gone for both designs rather than stuck to one. Also, it's kind of unusual but I really like it. The rear toe links are at the back of the car, right at the back. It gives you great access. And it also allows you to easily measure them. Feels like there's no damping in that shock. I mean, I'll have to service all of them. Yeah, they're all sort of to varying degrees of damping. Um, I would like to get that anti-roll bar link, but it 
could be that the top arm there is completely um, stripped out inside so it will just fall out of the wait and see. I'm definitely going to have to get a new spur, I'm going to have to get both new belts. Uh, I don't immediately see anything else missing. I mean, obviously got the body shell posts are here taped to the battery deck, probably to get it in the box. First thing this will need is a bath. I mean, it's filthy. It's absolutely filthy. Grimy as anything. Interestingly, it has CVDs at the front. That's nice. Always good to have CVDs. In fact, those look like CVDs all around, are they? Yeah. Interestingly, this thing has got CVDs all around. I don't know if that's standard. Nice feature. Also has steering bump stops right on the front. Built onto the arms. It's unusual because you can't then adjust it for more steering. You're, you're stuck to what you have. And then if you start burning out servos, it's because you're not set the endpoints properly. Multiple shock mounting locations. Right, let's try and see what the diffs feel like. Feels like a ball bearing diff that's worn out. Pretty sure it's a ball diff. Certainly with what it feels like. Same in the front. Slightly tightened up, but could do a little bit more. Um, needs a service. They're not, they don't feel knackered. The back one's slightly worse than the front. Maybe, maybe not. But they both could use the service anyway, we'll do that. Yeah, did I overpay 50 pounds? I don't know, possibly. I don't like how it's, it's not hex hardware. It's star hardware, which is odd. Um, although they've made a bit of a mess here underneath. Obviously it's been ran outside as well. Uh, there's a bit of a mess here and here where they've, what have they done? Taking a slice out the chassis there slightly, but this post has, it's a servo post, has a hex screw. And this one has a hex screw as well. I'm not sure what that post is for because it doesn't reach anything. It sits in there. Maybe it's a battery post. Um, it has a hex screw, which is not the standard screws. But they may have a mess of putting them in. They're a bit worn out. So I have to look at that. There's some dreaded E clips holding the top arms on. Don't know about the bottom. Hinge pins are a little bit rusty, not an issue. But yeah, there's a lot of potential in this car. It just needs a bit of work and a bit of TLC. So what am I going to do with this? Well, my original plan was to get it all lovely and nice, fit a brushless system to it, get a new body shell, and sell it as a ready to run club racer for someone who wants to start out. It's perfect for it. However, club racing in the UK for touring cars, pretty dead. Not much going on. Some in England, not many in Scotland. Um, and besides, I've been talking about, for years, talking about starting up our little club again. The one amongst friends that we did a few years ago. I think 2015 was the last time we did it. Jeez. Wow. Anyway, it was raced roughly to BRCA. Um, sort of stock club rules back in the day from the brushed era. So... 27 turn brushed motors, um, 2S lipos or nickel metal hydrides, but preferably 2S lipos. Um, keeps the cost down, keeps the speeds down so you don't break too much. Nice and competitive, great fun, just amongst friends. Um, I use my old Team Lossy Triple XS for that. Matthew was using his uh, associated TC3. Um, so Rachel's brother was talking about maybe joining us for this club, which would be good. And get some numbers up. He's never raced before. He's hardly driven an RC. He's only ever used one. Um, so this, if I clean it up and get a, an old 27 turn stock racing motor, like I've got a P2K2 Pro up in the loft. I need to recondition it probably, but they're good motors. Almost as good as the Revenge of the Monster Pro, which I was using. Um, this could be set up perfectly well for an old brushed stock class to run amongst friends. I think, I think that's what we're going to do with it. Uh, at the end of the day, 
that's the era this shasta came from. So it's the era that this is best suited to. I think it'll be fun. Anyway, thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. And tune in another time to see where this goes. Yeah. See you later.